Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness, me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. I'm Dan Wilson. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wilson tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hey, welcome along. Great to see Tony Abbott with uh, Nigel. I reminded him of my plan. Commonwealth citizens can sit in the House of Commons and they're eligible to serve in Cabinet. And I said he should be the Bonner Law, uh, Britain's only Canadian Prime Minister. He should be the Bonner Law of the 21st century. Tony Abbott for PM. I'd be interested to see what the Tory membership make of that. They don't seem terribly warmed up to uh, the present choice. On tonight's Mark Stein Show, more words to live by from Kamala Harris. Who doesn't enjoy that? Meanwhile, back in the real world, inflation is clobbering your paycheck to the point where the United Kingdom has supposedly seen the fastest drop in wages since records began. Don't get too excited. Records only began, apparently, in 1999 or something like that. Uh, Jasmine Bertels is here, and she's going to make some sense of that. Dr. Asim Malotra is back to demand the full, re uh, full release of Pfizer's raw trial data and an end to all remaining vaccine mandates uh, in an exclusive interview about his open letter to Boris Johnson and Joe Biden. You know those fact-checkers who are all over Facebook these days? It turns out when you fact-check the fact-checkers... Uh, they uh, are funded by a company called Pfizer. Natalie Winters is going to explain that one to us. And we hear another personal story from the ranks of a group of people the totalitarian goons at social media says doesn't exist. Victims of the vaccine. Susie Copsey is with us. Plus the most vital part of the show, all the more important when we live in the constant swirl of a blizzard of lies. Your comments and questions, send them along by email, gbviews at gbnews.uk. You can Twitter me at GB News. But first, as ever, the latest headlines with Ray Addison. Thanks, Mark. Here's the latest from the GB Newsroom. Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak have criticised Scotland's First Minister as they take part in hustings in Perth. Facing Tory party members, both candidates promised to increase scrutiny of the Scottish government if they take the reins at number 10. They also stressed their opposition to a referendum on Scottish independence. The former Chancellor said that the Scottish government's main focus right now must be the cost of living crisis. I want to end this devolve and forget mentality, so I will not be shy about calling out the SNP's record 
on things like drug and alcohol abuse because it's not good enough and the Scottish people deserve better. <laughs> and at a time when millions of people are anxious about the cost of living this winter, politicians should be relentlessly focused on addressing that. And I'd say that to Nicola Sturgeon, that is the priority, not another divisive, unnecessary constitutional referendum. Well, meanwhile, Liz Truss says she believes the UK is a family which should not be separated. Full of enterprise and ideas from Adam Smith to JK Rowling. But the fact is, Scotland has been let down by Nicola Sturgeon and the SNP government. They have been pursuing an agenda of separatism rather than dealing with the issues they created in the Scottish education system, in the NHS and in the transport system. And I know the people of Scotland deserve better and they want better. The High Court has heard how one Foreign Office advisor warned ministers that torture and even killings are accepted by the Rwandan government. The opinion came weeks before the British government tried to send asylum seekers to the African nation. The Foreign Office is now asking the court to keep extracts from two document, uh, documents secret, saying their disclosure would harm national security. The hearing comes ahead of a legal challenge to the Rwanda policy, which will be heard in September. A channel migrant is under investigation after an incident in which border force and private security officers were allegedly assaulted. GB News has been told it took place on Friday as around 40 asylum seekers were being transferred from Dover Harbour to a processing site. A source says a 21-year-old migrant left a male border force officer with potentially life-altering nerve damage to his shoulder. A Home Office spokesperson said, we do not comment on live police investigations. Former pop stars and pop idol contestant Darius Campbell Dinesh has been found dead in his US apartment at the age of 41. After appearing on Pop Idol, he forged a successful stage career, including West End roles in Chicago and Guys and Dolls. Former pop stars judge Nikki Chapman has described him as a true gent. The cause of his death is not yet known. We're on TV, online and on DAB Plus Radio. This is GB News. Back now to Mark Stein. Cause unknown died suddenly. Uh, there's a lot of it about and you'd think people might be more interested in why there is so much of it about. Thank you, Ray. These are troubling times, as you'll know if you've seen your electric bill. Fortunately, the finest minds in our political class are working on our problems day and night, night and day. Ladies and gentlemen, the purported deputy leader of the free world. We know that we really are quite behind in terms of maximizing our collective understanding about how we will engage on the technology of today and what we can quickly and easily predict will be the technology over the next decades. Hallelujah! Thank God someone finally has the guts just to drop all the flim flam and say it. Uh, in case you didn't catch what she was saying, she said we really are quite behind and more than that we know we are quite behind at maximizing our collective understanding about how we will engage to easily predict what will be the technology over the next decades. That's it. She's nailed it. There's plenty of people, Jacinda Ardern, Keir Starmer, who share our collective understanding about how we will engage. But do they maximize it? I don't think so. You shouldn't even begin to attempt to engage, no matter how well you may collectively understand it, if you don't even recognize how totally behind we are at maximizing it. At this point, I usually stick my hand up and ask, uh, what's the capital of Saudi Arabia? But the purported deputy leader of the free world wasn't done yet. So to maintain our position as the United States of America on this issue, it is critical that we work together to understand where we are, to recognize and have the courage to speak truth about what is obsolete, 
and then to partner to ensure that we are speaking the same language with the same motivation, inspired by the opportunity of it all. Inspired by the opportunity. It is critical that we work together to understand where we are. And understanding where we are doesn't mean understanding where we used to be. We don't need to work together on that. You can outsource it to an intern. But understanding where we are requires us to work together because it's critical to partner to ensure that we are speaking the same language. She's, when she's on, she's on. When she's right, she's right. And you can't speak the same language if you're not partnering. Without a partner, you can speak any language you like because there's no one around to hear. But if you have a partner, you can speak the same language. Could be Slovene, could be Uzbek, no need to get hung up on the details, but you can speak the same language to work together to understand where we are. Are we having press duck at the Tour d'Argent in Paris? Or are we in the hangar lane gyratory system on a Friday afternoon? That's the only way we'll maximize our collective understanding about how we will engage about where we are. Oh, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, is our entire political discourse just one almighty leg pull? No, not at all. Kamala Harris has hundreds of staffers and a full team of writers. And they wouldn't put her out there in public saying stuff like that if they didn't think it reassured people that she's just the person to take over from Joe Biden a couple more cases of rebound COVID down the road. Meanwhile, back on planet Earth, how about the critical importance of maximizing our collective understanding of how we will engage with what they used to call the economy? The headlines are getting more and more doom-laden. The Times... Look at this, record fall in real UK wages. Uh, let's have a look at the Express. UK wages fall to new low. Uh, more pay to come. How about the, uh, our old pals at the BBC? What have the Beeb got to say? Inflation drives fastest fall in real pay on record. Inflation is currently at 13%. Have you been offered a 13% pay increase? I don't think so. So what's going on? Jasmine Bertels of The Money Magpie joins me. Jasmine, every time we talk about this, mm. uh, it's, it's not quite, even if we are in recession territory, it's not quite like a normal recession. Here we have a tight labor market. Uh, there's very few workers. Uh, you know, pubs and restaurants are just opening, you know, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, because they can't get any staff for the rest of the week. Uh, and that would normally mean that wages would be going up. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yes. And, and I think many employers, if they could, would be doing that. Mm. Um, but then many, many employers, particularly if they have a, a shop or you know, some sort of physical um, mm. operation, um, they have many, many other increasing costs, so particularly energy, of course, petrol, etc. So the difficulty, I, I was just speaking to a hotel manager mm. this morning, and he said that it's very, very difficult for them to get basic work Workers, certainly um, who would be on uh, the living wage because they don't see why they should do the actual work for that kind of low pay and you can see where they're coming from of course mm. so we do have this difficulty for many businesses where they they would like to pay more in order to get the staff but they feel that they can't at the moment but are, are we not in danger of being back in a 1970s moment where mm. uh, oh 13 percent yeah we'll increase your pay 13 percent mm. oh but wait inflation's gone up to 20 percent yes uh, so we're gonna now you're behind again are mm -hmm. we getting are we likely to wind up stuck in that Kind of yeah, and th this is this is the problem with with rampant inflation, where where you have, say, for example, the the train drivers. I mean, understandably, like that anybody would want to have um, a pay increase to keep up with inflation. Mm. If they get it, that is going to increase the price of train tickets, which will then in turn mm. increase inflation. Yeah. You know, and so it spirals. And so you have places like you know, Turkey with 80 percent um, inflation. You've got Estonia with 22 percent inflation. Argentina has been in, in rampant inflation for decades. Mm. And it, it's very, very difficult to get yourself out of it um, without causing enormous amounts of pain. And, and that's what happened at the end of the 70s, early 80s with yeah, pain. Yeah, we had the pain. Mm. 
we had uh, a decade of, of kind of uh, out of control factors, yeah. and then we had some pain, yes. and the situation stabilized. Here, we seem to have actually had the pain first with the <laughs> yes. COVID lockdown. Yes. And this is like some kind of random play where they've put all the scenes on in the wrong order. Yes. I mean, it just seems as if uh, this is, as I said, it's not behaving in normal you can't apply normal recession models to what's going on no well the, the thing is i think it's it's 1970s with knobs on mm. because in the 1970s we didn't have the qe quantitative easing mm. money printing mm. so we've had money printing since 2008 for the next decade most of that money just got put into banks and disappeared goodness knows yeah. where um, largely actually into the housing market which was ridiculously inflated by all this cheap money but then when it came to lockdown we had insane amounts of money printed which then went into the economy and went into our pockets mm. amazingly and that absolutely turbocharged the inflation but we have the recessionary well that as well as you know the lockdown just clamping down on all production right. and services right. business uh, etc but we have the stagnation at the same time as yeah. well, which of course we did have in the 70s as well. So we have this stag stagflationary environment with a stagnant economy, potentially, and rampant inflation. Except that here we, st I mean, what's so weird, we stagnated it ourselves here. The government mm. took the decision to tank yeah. the economy, basically. Yes. Um, then we discover, as we talked about on yesterday's show, that for the first time ever, more than a million work visas were handed out uh, in, in the last 12 months. So how do you wind up with a tight labour market mm. when you've let in more than a million new workers? It is extraordinary, isn't it? But then one situation that we have, again, from lockdown is Firstly, a lot of over 50s have simply mm. left the market. I mean, we're talking 1.2 million that mm. have. There are more over 65s that have come back in, as it happens. Um, there's been quite a spike there. But then you have a lot of people who had really rather a nice time on mm -hmm. furlough. And again, you can understand it. If, if you're getting rather happily, you know, staying at home, being paid yeah. to do nothing, well, that's a really rather nice thing to get used to doing. <laughs> and so when it comes to coming back into work in any form, a lot of people have thought, why should I, really? Honestly, yeah. why should I? And the other problem that we have at the moment, and I've heard this from a, a GP of 30 years standing, yeah. is that she said for the first time in her life, she's getting loads and loads of her patients asking for her to sign them off sick All because right. they've actually been told by the benefits office to get themselves signed off sick in order to get benefits. Um, and I think this is happening around the country, it's certainly not just in her surgery. Fantastic. So we, we have imported a million people, but we, if we import two million, it'll just mean that three million people decide they're <laughs> sick and they're going to be on bed. I mean, it, can this be f fixed? by a normal flesh and blood political leader. Yeah, quite. I'd, no, I think, honestly, not a normal flesh and blood one. I think mm. we need a, a team of people who are absolutely determined, will push it, push through really difficult, unpopular policies. Um, mm. And there are very few people who are willing to do that. Everybody wants to be liked right now. I understand it, but it's not what we need at the moment. We need some we need some tough stuff coming. Well, going. But, but basically everyone, to one degree or another, is figuring that there's going to be real pain this winter mm -hmm. and that the way to do that is to fly over everybody's back garden and drop pound notes into the back garden. Yeah. And we've we printed all the pound notes from the 22nd century. So we're basically printing money that won't have any real world existence until the 23rd century now. Sadly, yes. But then, you know, I look back to 2008 and we spent, was it 58 billion pounds shoring mm. up? Um, NatWest or you know yeah. one of the banks so 58 billion honestly if we did that again now we could potentially pay <laughs> <laughs> half of, of people's uh, energy bills uh, over the winter you know that it, personally I would rather that happen you know at least it would be it would keep people um, alive and well yeah that's the way to think you Mrs Scroggins of uh, 47 Elm Street you could be the 2008 big shot bankster <laughs> of the winter of 2023 yes. that's uh, now you're thinking Jazz. <laughs> uh, we like that. Everybody.
everybody, everybody is going to be a NatWest chairman mm -hmm. in the in yep. the bright new dawn of Might tomorrow. Might as well be. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Jasmine. Always good Thanks. to see you. Uh, your reaction up next, GB Views at GBNews.uk. Plus, inflation, heating bills, supply chain disruptions. How did we get here? Well, as uh, we were suggesting, through disastrous public policy shoved down our throats by a lockstep media, the policy choices made to deal with a temporary crisis have now created a non-temporary crisis that's going to be very hard to get past. Dr. Asi Malotra and Natalie Winters are here to explore various aspects of that. Stick around, we're coming right back. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. GB News is the people's channel, so let's hear what the people have to say. We're talking about 13% inflation. Are you getting a 13% pay rise? Ian says, we signed a two-year pay deal last year. This year's pay rise is inflation with a minimum of 2%. It's supposed to be set at September's rate. Oh, you have uh, landed with your bottom in the butter, Ian, because by September, inflation will be whatever it is, 27%. But uh, Ian says, it uh, will be interesting to see if the company honours it or not. Aye, there's the rub. Barry says, welcome to Brexit Britain, a place where if you are gullible enough, you can actually vote to make yourself, your family and your country poorer. You should have followed what Jasmine was saying, talking about uh, inflation is far worse in Estonia which is in the European Union. Inflation is far worse in many uh, European Union uh, countries. So, oddly enough, voting stay in the European Union. It's, odd, it's almost as if however you vote, you're making yourself poorer these days. You want to look at the big picture here, Barry. Padge says, I'm a self-employed fishmonger. Actually, is there any other kind? I don't, I don't think there is a big fish, is there? I can't... There's no big chain store like Fish R Us or anything, is there? Anyway, Padge says, I'm a self-employed fishmonger. Fish has almost doubled. People starting to tighten their belt. I'm working for a lot less while life is costing a lot more. All at once from all angles. You got it, Padge. Uh, basically, if you haven't made your pile by the time this COVID thing started, the lockdown, then the cost of living, cost of lockdown, cost of living, 
Uh, if you didn't make it beforehand, chances of making it now are a lot slimmer. As you know, we tried for weeks on end to get Sajid Jabbit to come on this show, and in the end we backed him into a corner where in order to get out of doing The Mark Stein Show, he was driven to resign as health secretary and self-detonate his political career. So there's some other bloke in the job now. And yesterday, he tweeted as follows, quote, I've accepted the advice of the JCVI on which vaccines should be offered in the autumn booster program to potentially broaden immunity and relieve pressure on the NHS, unquote. All sounds a bit bloodless and detached, doesn't it? As if he's trying to distance himself. I've accepted the advice of the Joint Committee on Vaccine and Immunizations. I was only obeying advice. Sorry, pal, doesn't work like that. You're Her Britannic Majesty's Principal Secretary of State for Health and Social Care. And that means that in the Westminster system, you're responsible, no matter that you're trying very artfully not to nail your own colors to the vaccine mask. Still, it's an interesting shift in tone, at least compared to the good old days of certainty. You're OK. You're not going to you're not going to get COVID if you have these vaccinations. You're not going to get COVID if you have these vaccinations. Talk about your fake news. Can we get an Ofcom investigation going on that guy? Since saying that, the quadruple vaccinated Joe Biden has had the COVID twice within three weeks. Or how about Dr. Sarah Kayat with her claim that you're 100% protected against hospitalization and death? Was there ever any basis for saying what Joe Biden or Dr. Sarah said? I was startled to read this earlier today, what was reported in the mainstream news as being 95 percent effective against infection was, in fact, relative risk reduction, not absolute risk deduction from the double-blind, randomized controlled trial that took place during the more lethal circulating post-Wuhan ancestral strain of the virus. That specific New England Journal of Medicine paper, which underpinned the emergency use authorization of the Pfizer mRNA vaccine, actually revealed an absolute risk reduction of 0.84%. 0.84%. In other words, for every 119 individuals vaccinated, one person would be protected from being infected, unquote. For every 119 persons vaccinated, one will be protected from infection. That's from an open letter to Joe Biden and Boris Johnson and various parties uh, that also makes the point that your risk of an adverse side effect from the vaccines is greater than your risk of hospitalization from COVID. The author of that open letter, Dr. Asim Malotra, joins me now. That's actually uh, quite a staggering number, because if we'd been told that 18 months ago, the whole conversation would have been entirely different. It's a very good point, Mark. So to talk about what you were uh, mentioning earlier about certainty in, in medicine, mm. um, medical evidence, in medical evidence, in the history of medical evidence, today's truth may be tomorrow's folly. Mm. And medicine, unlike um, physics or chemistry, is not an exact science, it's an art. And it's based upon information that we're given at a particular time. And it's often the art of probabilities. But to answer your question more specifically, um, yes, looking back at that original trial that led to the approval of the Pfizer vaccine mm. and many other vaccines, um, if we talk about the Pfizer vaccine, for example, that trial, it showed this 95% relative risk reduction in infection. Everyone took on board mm. as thinking 95% if 100 people were yep. exposed, 95 would be protected, which is not the case. It was 0.84% from infection, if we trust that data implicitly, which, of course, many people did, even yes. though that data has never been released for independent analysis, which is something we're advocating for. Um, but in addition to that, Mark, that trial didn't show any reduction in death rates from COVID, statistically mm. uh, significant death rates from COVID, or all-cause mortality. So everything we had to go on at the beginning was based upon that figure that was exaggerated in terms of its benefits. I was one of those people that was one of the first to take, you know, I was, I'm double jabbed. Mm. I had the vaccine in January 2021 after volunteering the vaccine center. Even though I was young, I did it because I thought it was going to protect my patients from getting COVID. And, um, you know, the information has evolved since then. 
considerably. I've spent many months critically analyzing data, speaking to many eminent scientists in Oxford, in Stanford, in Harvard, speaking to Pfizer whistleblowers, mm. uh, and critically looking at that data in, in its totality. And uh, the situation has very much changed. So now we have, uh, uh, you know, we talked about the, this was, you know, in reference to the uh, ancestral strain of the virus, which was right. much more lethal. And it was certainly, especially for the elderly, it was awful, uh, certainly in 2020, what we experienced then. What's circulating now, Mark, and it's interesting you mentioned Sadia Javid talking mm. about this booster program, um, is essentially, and this is good, this is good news, mm. it's reassuring news, the Omicron strain that is circulating at the moment is no more, no more lethal than the flu. Right. We don't scare people to death around the flu. We shouldn't be scaring people to death around Omicron either. But, but one of the things you talk about is the loss of trust. I mean, we have seen that the, the take-up uh, for example, of the in in America, they're, they're you're supposed to get your six month old boosted, but apparently I think it's only 11 percent of parents of children, uh, and that's ha, have taken their kids to get these things. So so th th these vaccines are declining in popularity yeah. because there's a lack of trust in what the experts say. Now, when you talk about that, you know, uh, the one in 19 people uh, will be protected from uh, infection. The people who signed off on these vaccines in the public health bureaucracies of the yeah. West, yeah. they must have known that, mustn't they? Mark, I wouldn't say necessarily they did. I mean, I've spoke to very senior doctors leaders mm. uh, in the last few weeks. I've been giving lectures. I actually gave a lecture um, only a few weeks ago during the BMA annual conference. Mm. Uh, and attending that conference were senior doctors leaders like the chair of the BMA, the president mm. of the BMA, the deputy chair of the BMA. And uh, they were quite shocked with some of the information I was sharing with them. Mm. So, for example, uh, one very senior NSS leader was shocked to learn that the regulator Right. That, leads, that approves these vaccines, the MHRA, yeah. receive 86% of their funding from the pharmaceutical industry. He didn't believe it, actually. And then the BMJ exposed that only shortly afterwards. But, well, uh, and, 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 they, and they were also saying to me, it was interesting, I had a conversation with, with one of these NHS leaders, um, and he said to me, he said, Asim, I don't think many uh, people in these roles yeah. who are promoting the vaccine are critically appraising the evidence themselves, yeah. and they are getting most of their inf information from the BBC. Now, yeah. this is not unusual because Rochelle Walensky, the former chair of the CDC, actually admitted not so long ago her optimism for the <laughs> vaccine yeah. came from a CNN news report, which Paul Thacker, right. uh, investigative journalist, basically exposed as being almost a an identical, it was, a, it was essentially the press release of Pfizer that was a CNN news report. And so, this so, is quite so yeah. Pfizer write the press release <laughs> for the CNN guy, uh, somebody in the public health bureaucracy of the United, the most lavishly funded public health bureaucracy, watches the CNN news report and thinks, oh, everything's hunky-dory. Hunky but the, the, the problem here is that when you say, like, the, the regulatory body in the United Kingdom, the Medical Health and Regulatory regulatory agency, MHRA, is 86% funded by Big Pharma. Now, 50 years ago, when everybody was worried about lung cancer from smoking, and if you had said, oh, yes, we've got our, our uh, Ministry of Health is 86% funded by uh, Philip Morris and the big tobacco companies, people would have leapt up and said, this is crazy. Why aren't they leaping up now? I think because they don't know it so much, Mark, mm. and that's important that we have these conversations and we're getting this message out to, mm. you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. Mm. And uh, that's the main reason people aren't aware. So I, what I say is to paraphrase Noam Chomsky, the, mm. uh, the American economist, yeah. uh, the doctors and the general population do, don't know what's happening mm. and they don't even know that they don't know. Yes. So I think we have to, people need to understand the structures that are in place that allow what ultimately is misinformation or certainly misleading information mm. to disseminate amongst doctors and the population mm. is rooted in too much unchecked power by entities whose only purpose is to gain profit, not mm. to look after your health. And I'm talking about the pharmaceutical industry here. Mm. And they have captured the regulator. And just, you know, Donald Light, sociologist in the BMJ, recently said, um, you know, people need to understand that the regulators uh, as long as they continue to be captured by industry, cannot be trusted because they are selective, mm. they withhold data, 
um, and, uh, and then this ultimately has a detrimental effect if they are approving drugs without rigorous independent critical analysis of what that data tells us and then how does that data get translated into the conversation between you and I, between the doctor and the patient or the member of the public. So mm. if the doctors are misinformed, the patients then get misled and misinformed. Well, that, that's true, but at the same time, we, have a, we also have a media problem here because we have things that seem very odd. We have an, an excess mortality rate right now, have had really all spring and summer of about 1,000 people a week. Now, it, dead bodies isn't a sophisticated concept. Everybody can, even the most stupid Fleet Street hack can grasp that there's a lot more dead bodies around than there should be. Why is there a reluctance to actually have an honest look at what's causing that? It's a great question, Mark. So I think with a lot of these things, certainly, uh, it's the, the, the excess deaths is probably likely multifactorial. Mm. So before, let's say, for example, the vaccines came into the equation in mm. terms of the harms, which you've mm. highlighted mm. Uh, very consistently on this, mm. uh, on this program, I would have said, OK, this is probably to a large degree being driven by the end result of lockdowns. Mm. You know, we know I'm as a cardiologist, I know the, how heart disease develops, how people can develop heart attacks quite quickly, how people can have sudden cardiac death linked to lifestyle factors, including poor diet and stress. Yeah. Right. And we know that people's diets got worse and people are under a lot of stress. But to answer your questions very specifically mm. in terms of things that aren't being looked at. So, for example, yeah. could the vaccine be linked to these excess deaths? Yeah. That's the question. I would say it's willful blindness by many people. And I would say uh, and then this is through my own experience speaking mm. to people. So what does that mean? People turning a blind eye yeah. in order to feel safe, mm. to avoid con conflict, mm. to reduce anxiety and to protect prestige. Right. And many people, certainly vaccine injuries are a real thing. There's no doubt about mm. it. The question is, what is the extent of those injuries mm. and how does that balance against what the benefit of the vaccine is? And we haven't got the answer quite precisely yet, but we're getting there. And what I would say for me as a doctor, what really concerned me, and you mentioned it in the letter we wrote to President yeah. Biden and Boris Johnson and actually published in European Scientist, mm. is um, very eminent doctors, very eminent scientists, Peter Doshi, associated mm. with the BMJ, Robert Kaplan from Stanford. Mm. In one of their preprint publica pre publications, they were able to get access to new data from Pfizer and Moderna original trials mm. on the vaccine. And what they found is shocking. Mm. As you said earlier, mm. that in the trial itself, it appeared that one was more likely to suffer a serious adverse event from the vaccine, so disability, life-changing event, hospitalization, right. than they were to be hospitalized from COVID. And that was during the more lethal strain. Yeah. Now, if this is true, and there's a good reason to suggest that it is, then it changes everything. No, it does. And you... And did Pfizer know this? Did Moderna yeah. know this? Because in the history, of these sorts of uh, access to raw data occurring from yeah. previous drug trials. And as I said, today's truth may be tomorrow's folly. Raw data access isn't just about getting data on what happened in the trial with every participant yeah. specifically, and was it measured correctly at adverse effects, for example. It also involves getting access to internal emails yeah. between executives in, the, in those companies. And we need that now because, yes. you know, the, there is a lack of trust. We've got yeah. reduction uptake in boosters. This is not good. It's yeah. not good for other public health interventions. And I think the way around this is let's have an honest conversation with, with the public first and foremost. We, to some degree, were misled. Things have changed. Mm. Okay, we have to change with the evidence. Mm. But also, it's imperative now that we get that raw data released yeah. so it's independently analyzed so people can trust um, you know, information that's, that's being given to them when it comes to any kind of health intervention. Because if we don't, this problem is only going to get worse, Mark, I promise you. No, that's, uh, that's the big uh, takeaway uh, here. As you were saying, you've got more chance of having an adverse side effect from the vaccines than of the vaccine preventing you from hospitalization. And that is why... Potentially, yes. Potentially. Yes. And that is why we need to see everything from Pfizer, Moderna, AstraZeneca. It's interesting, too, uh, just as a qu uh, quick... Uh, Final thought on that. Normally, after something like the Spanish flu a century ago, your uh, mortality falls. 
because, you know, uh, with the COVID, uh, a guy who might have lived till 2021 or 2022 instead died of the COVID in 2020. So uh, there's normally a sort of correction in reduced mortality after a pandemic. This is weird to have yeah. an, an excess one. One other thing, Mark, I think is really important to mention, which surprised me mm. because I was somebody, again, that was on Good Morning Britain mm. to tackle vaccine hesitancy mm. because a film director, Gurinder Chadha, yeah. filmed it. Yep. No, no, I remember that. You know, yeah. she, she was vaccine hesitant and yeah. I said, because I conflated these vaccines with traditional vaccines, which right, are right. one of the safest drugs right. in the history of medicine, um, is that uh, I remember I was, being, I was with my dad and we got this, I think Public Health England sent out mm. some antibody tests mm. and we had to fill in a form and mm. I did the finger prick mm. and antibody. I was like, oh, the vaccine works and I tweeted it out. Yeah. And then I recently discovered, and people can look this up, the FDA since May 2021 on their own website have stated that there is that this is an unreliable surrogate. Antibodies are not reliable in terms of telling you whether you're protected uh, from infection or protection from COVID, especially after COVID-19 vaccinations. Right. That's extraordinary, right. absolutely right. extraordinary. No, that, no, you're right. There are many strange questions and strange indicators in this whole thing. Thank you, Doctor. It is uh, always good to talk to you. Yesterday, we reported on the editors of the British Medical Journal, uh, the BMJ, which back in November produced a peer-reviewed analysis of problems with data integrity in the Pfizer vaccine trials. Then the Facebook quote-unquote fact-checkers got to work and killed the BMJ story, consigning it to a URL with the words hoax alert. Fact-checking is a phony baloney pseudo-industry that has ballooned with the degeneration of the entire internet into a cabal of woke billionaires. Full fact, for example, is funded by those same woke billionaires. Anyway, that was yesterday. The story gets better. If you're wondering why these fact checkers seem minded to bury anything critical of Pfizer, it turns out Facebook's fact checkers are in fact funded by Pfizer. Natalie Winters broke the story in the National Pulse and she joins us now. Natalie, uh, this sounds a little too obvious to be true. Pfizer's funding the Facebook fact checkers. Hi, I don't think we can uh, hear you, Natalie, or at any rate, I can't hear you. If it's, if it's just me, could someone switch Ma Natalie up in my ear? Oh, no, we don't have her. Oh, OK, great. OK, Stump the Steins looming, uh, GB Views at GBNews.UK, plus uh, the list of vaccine victims gets even longer. We'll be hearing the story of 42-year-old John O'Neill next, and we're going to try and get Natalie Winters back for you, because it's, uh, it's never the same without Natalie. Don't touch that dial, we're heading right back. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. 
I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. We've got a new set of uh, two rusting tin cans with a piece of long string between them. So I think we can now go back to Natalie Winters. Natalie, uh, can this be true uh, that Facebook's fact checkers are funded by Pfizer? I think maybe Facebook and Pfizer are trying to uh, interrupt our audio connection because they don't want this information to get out. Yeah. Um, but I think this story really explains why you're seeing a lot of the activity on behalf of the fact checkers on these social media platforms like Facebook. So there's a group called the International Center for Journalists. And while it has a sort of innocuous sounding name, um, this is a group that Facebook has partnered with and funded for a very, very long time to help kind of train their own fact checkers that they use on their own platforms. That's of course mm. Facebook, Instagram, Meta, the parent company owns a lot of these, very, even WhatsApp, they've even started going through people's private messages. Um, but what's really interesting is that the most recent fellowship program launched by the International Center for Journalists Believe it or not, its sponsor is actually Pfizer. So I dug into the really the relationship between Pfizer and this group, and it goes back to at least 2008. You can see Pfizer has been funding a variety of fellowships and training programs for journalists, not just in, West, in Africa, Latin America, specifically focused on health news, um, even in some ways cardiovascular news, which is certainly interesting. Um, but if you read about these All programs, right. they brag about how they have, have reached into a lot of mainstream media outlets. Yeah, it's, it's very weird that, and uh, particularly as the Facebook fact-checking, as with the British Medical Journal story, uh, seems very concerned to suppress stories that are not favorable to Pfizer. Well, what's particularly interesting about the group that suppressed that BMJ story, um, it's a group called Lead Stories. And this is an entity that we at the National Pulse have, have liaised with for probably over a year now. We first exposed them um, for not being this kind of independent arbiter of truth mm. that Facebook presents them to be. Their staff is actually entirely comprised of people who have donated to political candidates. All of them have gone to Democrats. Um, they also have over 130 yeah. years of journalistic experience at CNN. So that tells you where their bias is. <laughs> but what's most interesting about lead yeah. stories is that one of their clients, the people who pay their bills, is TikTok which is, of course, the Chinese Communist Party controlled app. And previously, oh. uh, when I worked with Steve Bannon's War Room show, we actually got the editor of that yeah. outlet to admit on air that he was, quote, very comfortable, that's a direct quote, with his relationship with the Chinese Communist yeah. Party and being on the payroll um, of effectively an asset of that you know, brutal regime. So that tells you about where there are so many conflicts of interest, whether it's Big Pharma or the Chinese Communist Party, these fact checkers um, are not conflict of interest free, even though they purport to be. No, th this just gets better and better. What a, what a show. Thank you very much for that, Natalie. So uh, your fact checkers yep. are, are in bed with the Chai Coms and your medical regulatory agencies are funded by the big pharmaceutical company. It's, 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 a com it's not a complicated thing to look for. In the old days when we had real investigative journalists, uh, something like the Sunday Times would have been all over this. Thank you very much, Natalie. Uh, at GB News, we tell the stories of vaccine victims because very few other media outlets seem to want to do so. John O'Neill is a 42-year-old man from Essex. He has a wife and two young children. Uh, there they are. That's uh, Freya in the middle and her younger brother Mason with their dad. I'm not sure whether they're in a park or the back garden or whatever it is, but John can't go running around with his kids anymore. He can't go pushing them on the swings, catching them off the slide, because nine days after getting the AstraZeneca vaccine, he had a massive stroke 
on the left-hand side of his brain that has left him blind in one eye, riddled with blood clots, and paralyzed down the right-hand side of his body. Uh, he also has aphasia, uh, which the movie star Bruce Willis has just been diagnosed with. It affects your ability to write, to talk, and to comprehend others. And just for all the naysayers out there, John has been officially diagnosed with VIT, vaccine-induced thrombotic thrombocytopenia. It's a lot for a young wife and just devastating for their two children because their dad is a completely different person from who he was before he had that shot. And the family has started a crowdfunding page uh, to raise some £50,000 to aid with his recovery. His sister, Susie Copsey, joins me now. Uh, Susie, first of all, how, how's your brother doing? Because at one point, you all thought he was going to die. The doctors told you he was unlikely to survive. We did, yeah. We were really lucky that he mm. actually came through this. Um, but obviously, with the extent of the brain damage that John suffered, there isn't going to be a full recovery. You, mm. you cannot have a full recovery from it. He's working really hard with speech therapists to try and work on his speech, physical therapists to try and work, um, you know, on his physicality and mm. things like that. But a full recovery is not on the cards. It is really, really difficult because with a stroke where the brain damage was so significant, it now needs to make new pathways for that information yeah, no, to get it's through. A, a terrible thing that you yeah. have to. You have to find workarounds for things that were just done easily. You do. You, you've said, um, I, I take it you still haven't received this risible £120,000 from the government that is for the vaccine no. uh, compensation. Uh, some people who've been on this show have now received it. I think uh, they've, they started sending out the cheques a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. um, how, how tough is it then uh, for your brother's wife and children with, without him in the equation there? It's incredibly tough. I mean, from a financial point of view, John was an IT engineer. He mm. made a wonderful living. They had a really lovely life. Um, so for that to stop, because he will never be able to work again, you know, the financial implications of it are devastating, mm. along with the things that he can't do now as well. Mm. So there's two sides of it. You've got the financial side and you've got the side where this VIT was so devastating. Yeah. It's just completely changed what he's able to do with his kids. Like John loves football. He's such a football oh, fan. No, no. And I mean, no, it's, it's uh, uh, when you have young children like that, you, you want to expend what energy you have running around with them. And it's, yeah. and it's terrible for the children, too, because their father is... They will think of, when they're older, they will think of their father in a different way, not as the guy who played football with them, but as a guy they went and stood at the bedside of. It's a, a totally different thing. You, go, you are at great pains on your crowdfunding page to yeah. say you're not an anti-vaxxer. And obviously mm -hmm. you're not, because he took, he took the vax. He's 42. He didn't actually need to take it at 42, as we were talking about earlier, but he took it. Uh, are you a bit shocked at the way anyone who complains about these vaccine injuries or vaccine bereavements is dismissed? Some guy did it uh, on this network, actually, earlier today, is dismissed as anti-vaxxers. Massively. I have it all the time. When I'm on Twitter, um, I have people calling me anti-vaxxers, and it's actually not the case at all. Mm. You know, my two children have been vaccinated since birth from, like, chickenpox and mm. the rest of it. So generally, we're not anti-vaxxers. It's just because this has happened to John, and then you realise as time goes on that it's happening to more and more people, mm. that you realise there is a massive problem here, mm. and it is with these COVID vaccines, but it's just not being spoken about. You won't see it on mainstream media. You don't see it on any daytime TV programmes. We've contacted you know, many programmes, magazines, everything mm. as a family, and no one will cover it. So. Um, no, yeah, that that's a shock, and, and it's not just that, but it's that the 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 telly the telly doctors, these nice, cosy, friendly people, mm -hmm. sitting on the sofa, uh, tell you it's one hundred percent safe, effective, preventing hospitalisation, preventing death. Your brother nearly died. Yeah. Is is there is there a kind of bitterness about 
having, if he hadn't gone along to the clinic and got that shot that day, that fantastic young dad playing with his kids would still be around. It's really hard. I think one of the hardest things was, I mean, John really researches everything, mm. you know, he's a really intelligent guy and really looks into everything. And he had concerns. Mm. He was concerned. He'd heard about these clots. And he actually said to his wife, you know, I am concerned about this. What we'll do is I'll have AstraZeneca, mm. you have Pfizer, and then if anything happens, there's one of us left for the children. That's, that's, uh, sadly was exactly what happened. That's, that's like incredible. So he actually, because that's like the royal family, not all flying on the same plane. So he actually thought, well, in case anything happens, one of us will be around. Yeah. But then at the same time, you always, you know, you don't actually believe it's going to happen to you. There wasn't, even though it was heard of that there were clots, it mm. wasn't very well spoken about so you do think that it is just a one in a million thing and that it's not going to happen to you no well this is why we need to have a more honest conversation the last two years have been terrible and susie's brother uh, is actually a victim of that kind of closed shut down lockstep media it does nobody any favors and the and the treatment that you guys get when you mm -hmm. go on Twitter. It's like people think you're some crazy paranoid conspiracy oh, theorist. I've had the lot. I've had, mm. you know, you're an anti-vax nut. Mm. We get comments like he completely deserved it for taking the clot shot. It's, uh, uh. It's, it's tough. But it's so important that his story gets out there for so many different reasons. No. I mean, yes, number one, I'm fundraising for John because he yeah. needs the money to pay for his therapy. And that, and that have, have you applied for this vaccine payment from the government? So it's not me personally. So John and his wife, yeah. they've applied for it. As yeah. far as I'm aware, they haven't had it yet. Um, but going back to sharing his story and why it's important, mm. like I say, yes, I'm fundraising because he needs the funds to pay for his medical no. bills. And it's also things like raising awareness of what the symptoms of VITT are. Yeah. It's not about being anti-vax. You know, if we can raise awareness of what the symptoms are and we can save another family from going through it, you know, that would be incredible. I don't want anybody, any other family to go through what we have. No, it's a, it's a terrible thing and it's heartbreaking to look mm. at that, I, you, that photo of John with his two young children playing with them, 42 years old, in good health and the remains of his life are going to be very different. Thank you so much, Susie. Thank you. And do give our best to John and his family. And if you want to help out, you can uh, go and find out uh, uh, about the crowdfunding thing. A quick search of Susie's name will bring you to it on the internet. Uh, that'll do it for us. Uh, Dan Wooden is here for the Killer Late Night Show on British telly. What you got, Dan? Mark Stein, it's one of those days where I think, has the world just gone completely and utterly bonkers? The RAF no longer hiring white mm. men. Well, what does uh, yes. Conservatives Against Racism's <laughs> Alvi Avancona think about that? He's here. Plus, Edinburgh Festival now buying into the cancellation of comedy. Jim Davidson will mm. react. And Mark, Tony Blair uh, yeah. trying to muzzle us again, say that the entire population must be boosted to save the NHS. Why doesn't he just butter oh, on my our lives God. once and for all? <laughs> so we're covering all of that today. No, that doesn't... I can't wait for that stuff about the RAF. I think of all those dashing pilots in books I read as a boy with their handlebar moustaches. And uh, nobody wants them anymore. It's, uh, it's very sad. Great stuff, Dan. All coming up after the weather. Stay safe, stay free. Hello, I'm Ada McGiven from the Met Office. We've certainly seen some lively weather during the last couple of days and showers will continue in places during the next 24 hours. Although it is turning drier in the north as an area of high pressure starts to build in. That's settling things down for Scotland, Northern Ireland and Northern England. That dry weather is on the way south, but uh, low pressure over the channel is maintaining some showers and even some thunderstorms heading into the evening and overnight. So further heavy downpours, hit and miss, not everyone will catch one of these, but where they do occur, well, it could be some tricky conditions on the roads, could be some surface water flooding, for example. It's 15 or 16 Celsius in the south, much fresher further north where skies are clearing for Scotland, Northern Ireland and Northern England as the night goes on. And then a sunny start for many in the north, 
Wednesday morning. Still some areas of rain or showers across central and southern England as well as south Wales. And then really the risk of some torrential downpours across southeast England, East Anglia in particular by the afternoon. 24 Celsius in the southeast, so turning progressively cooler and we're looking at high teens, low 20s elsewhere, although a pleasant day to come with light winds and plenty of sunshine for Scotland, Northern Ireland and Northern England. The clear skies don't last long in the north. It turns cloudy by the evening and some rain returns to western Scotland and Northern Ireland, although most of this is light to moderate, so not causing any real issues. The showers in the south fade away overnight. Still one or two about first thing Thursday, though, and a warm start, 15 or 16 Celsius. A, a gap there across central parts of the UK as we begin the day on Thursday, some sunshine. But Scotland, Northern Ireland turn wet with the outbreaks of rain spilling in from the Atlantic. That reaches West Wales by the end of the afternoon and it spreads across the rest of the country later in the day, turning to showers on Friday, but drier for many on Saturday. Join my show, Farage, 7pm till 8pm, Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 